Welcome to Kingdom in Context. The Creator never intended for us to be confused by His words. He gave us His words of life, and He gave them in context, to be understood and beneficial to our walk with Him. This channel's goal is to bring clarity to some of the misconceptions that have formed over time among believers and taught by others, however innocent and well-intended. The scriptures make complete sense when we keep them in context of His coming kingdom and His coming King, Jesus the Messiah. If you're blessed by what we're doing with this channel and feel led to support us, visit the video description below where we have a PayPal option, a monthly Patreon option, or a traditional P.O. Box address. Thank you, and remember, context creates comprehension. Shabbat Shalom and happy Feast of Tabernacles. Welcome back to Kingdom Portions. My name is Sean Griffin. I'm here with my amazing and lovely co-host, my wife. Hey guys, Shabbat Shalom. I'm Lindsay. Happy Sukkot. Happy Sukkot, sweetie. Happy Sukkot, babe. And Shabbat Shalom. Hi, Holy Day, Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, Hi, Holy Day, Shabbat right. Shalom. <laughs> That's right. Depending on what calendar you use, yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, the calendars, people have different um, variations of their own calendar. <laughs> Uh, us in particular, this this current week in the seven day span, we're celebrating, you know, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I know some people will celebrate a day later, some people an entire two weeks later. You know, it just depends on what calendar you're on. But um, that'll be for a different video. We'll we'll do videos in the future. I know so many people have been asking us about those questions, but uh, there are actual prophecies in the Book of Jubilees, and specifically about the uh, the calendars and about us trying to keep the feast and observe these special days. And, um, and so I think it'll, it, in my opinion, it kind of makes it easy. It takes the stress off of it yeah. and helps people clear up real quick this idea, this, this unnecessary fretting that we see happening amongst fellow believers when they come into this realization that all of God's words are applicable for them. And they start, they start seeing Leviticus 17 or excuse me, Leviticus 23. And they start realizing, oh wait, these feast days are throughout this, like God's version of his, mm -hmm. you know, holidays. And he wants us to do those always. And even when he comes back in the millennial reign, we're going to be doing these holidays as well. And so people start getting this urgency to do them. And that's very good. That's awesome. But then they start this debate immediately yeah. about well, what day is the correct day to do them? When, whose calendar do we go off of? The Julian? The Gregorian? What, what's going on here? Uh, the ancient Hebrew? Do we follow the moon? Do we follow <clears throat> this? The stars? It's just, uh, it, it gets to become very laborious. And uh, so we'll do a video on that in the future. Uh, this, so you know, you're welcome to put in the comments, uh, happy feast of tabernacles or happy feast of booths, but we're not trying to engage in a full lengthy debate as far as the actual day it is, um, that we're actually celebrating this and whether it's the right or the wrong day. And because we are, we'll put out stuff in the future that will clear that up. So this, this week we are going to be discussing Moses's song in Deuteronomy 32 and pretty much the entire portion. It's a lengthy chapter. The entire portion is going to be over Deuteronomy 32, but there's so much good stuff in this one, sweetie. That's why uh, I love this uh, Deuteronomy in general, but I love this chapter because it gives us a little glimpse into actually Moses doing some some prophet stuff, right? So normally when we think of prophets and we think of like, you know, Isaiah and Jeremiah, you know, people that are making these large proclamations of future events and things like that, we don't always get a lot of that from Moses, but at the end of Deuteronomy, you do. And he actually has, in this chapter 32, he has a full-on song where he goes over lots of fun stuff even leading up to the end of days. And I think that that's really fun because um, he was a prophet, you know, which is why the prophecy was the Messiah was going to be raised up like unto Moses, you know, and there's all those similarities and qualifiers between Yeshua of Nazareth and Moses. So just real quick, guys, if you're following along your Bibles at home, we're going to start off in Deuteronomy 32. That's what we're going to be reading for our first portion part, excuse me. And uh, Deuteronomy 32, it says, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. That my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets of the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have acted corruptly towards him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your father who has brought you? He has made you and established you. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, 
When he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of the inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign god with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and he ate the produce of the field, and he made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds of cows and the milk of the flock, with fat of lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats, with the finest of the wheat and the blood of grapes you drank wine. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. Therefore he forsook God who made him, and scorned the rock of his salvation. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you, and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. And then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom no, is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and burns to the lowest parts of Sheol, and consumes the earth with its yield, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction. And the teeth of beasts I will send upon them, with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Outside the sword will bereave, and inside terror. Both young man and virgin, the nursling with the man of gray hair. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will remove the memory of them from men, had I not feared the provocation by the enemy, that their adversaries would misjudge, that they would say, Our hand is triumphant, and the Lord has not done all this. For they are a nation lacking in counsel, and there is no understanding in them. Would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern their future. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had given them up? Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies ju themselves judge this, for their vine is the vine of Sodom, and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison, their clusters bitter, their wine is the venom of serpents, and the deadly poison of cobras. Is it not laid up in the store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? Vengeance is mine, and retribution. In due time their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate his people, and will have compassion on his servants, when he sees that their strength is gone, and there is none remaining, bond or free. And he will say, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices, and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place." See that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries, and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the people. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance on his adversaries, and will atone for his land and his people. Then Moses came and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he with Joshua the son of Nun. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to your heart all the words which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law. For it is not an idle word for you, indeed it is your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land, which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain on the, of the Abraham, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the sons of Israel for possession. Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother died on Mount Or, and was gathered to his people. Because you broke faith with me in the midst of the sons of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen, because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the sons of Israel. For you shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I am giving the sons of Israel. It's intense. The poor guy gets told, hey, go up to the place where you're going to die. Um, so 
on one hand, the father is answering his prayer because remember Moses is like, you know, I would like to go see the land, and, and Yahweh's like, quit badgering me about this. He's like, I'll <laughs> let you see it, but you're not going in, right? And then at the end of it, you know, he's basically saying to him, hey, I'm, you know, go up to this mountain that you're gonna die up there, you know. So on, you know, there is a, you know, the big debate culturally was if you could know your date of death, would you want to know it? Hmm, yeah. You know. Moses got it. He got to know his date of death and his place of death. Uh, but he was cool with it. Why? Why would he be cool with it? And not not just because he got to go see the land of inheritance that was promised to those who believe in faith and obedience to the law of the covenant, right? But it's because that is the underlying premise of the covenant, which was that was the land that they were to cross into. And he wanted to go see this good and pleasant land. But at the same time, even all those people that was about to cross into that land, he knew they weren't going to live there forever. He knew the um, qualifiers of the Genesis 17, 8, verse 8 covenant with Abraham and Yahweh, which was that Abraham and his descendants all would live in this land of promise forever. Moses knew that the people coming out of the Exodus, that Joshua was going to then take across the Jordan into Jericho and then into the rest of the land, they weren't going to be there forever. Because they knew, just as he mentioned in, I think it was in, a, in this prayer, or in this song itself, um, he talks about, um, I don't know, what verse was that? In verse 22, he says, for fires kindled in Sheol. So he's acknowledging this concept of Sheol. And, and we've talked about Sheol, I think, in a couple other kingdom portions. But it is the place where all of us go and await, after we die, our spirits go to this place called Sheol, according to Scripture. And it's where we go and we await either judgment at the great white throne judgment or we're resurrected in the first resurrection event. Um, it's and, a compartment under the earth, just to clarify. Yeah, it's, it's literally in the, in the creation model. It's a compartment under the earth. Um, as Enoch calls it, it's like a cavernous place with, you know, smooth and hollow and wide. And there's uh, there's all the descriptions there. Like I said, we've, we've done, um, we've spoken about it in our kingdom portions. We also did an entire show about it in our honor of Kings on Saturday night with Ken and I. So I'll put the, the link in the descriptions in the, um, this little, thing you're seeing on the screen here is the the actual name of the show of that episode where we discuss Sheol Tartarus and the prison of the stars and everything like that so uh take check that out for further context but that's what that is why Moses can talk like this and be cool with it in my opinion it's because he knows he's going to go to Sheol and wait at the resurrection that was inherently included in the covenant even the covenant they were given here which is why he's talking about at the very end about how you know the words of this covenant are your life so that's where Moses is about to die. So this isn't guaranteeing him a mortal life or to be living in that moment because he just was told he's about to die. Well, if you think about it, he was also taken up on another mountain and shown probably the real promised land, the New Jerusalem, when he was given all of the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. He was told to build exactly what he was shown on the mountain. Right. So... Yeah, he, he sees, saw both promised lands. <laughs> well, he saw the heavenly tabernacle. Um, I, you know, how much of the actual land to come did he see? I'm not sure, but he definitely, definitely saw the heavenly tabernacle, as Hebrews tells us. And then now he's physically crossing into the territory, the geography, and that's where he's actually just wanting to see over the. What's funny to me though is that he's asking this, and um, you know, in all reality, that what they were promised was way bigger than just the land between yeah. the Mediterranean and the Jericho. Yeah. You know, and that's the point where uh, Solomon tried to fulfill those greater boundaries during his day uh, after David died. But Moses is just I think, you know, personally, I think it's just because this was like 40 years of unfulfilled, you know, goal. That was his goal. Right. Was to take these people out of Egypt, out of slavery into this land that was promised so they could flourish. And he never got to accomplish that. And here he is, you know, um, because of not only his unfaithfulness and his moments of you know, being obstinate and, you know, what did he say at the very end? Because he, what, broke faith? Was it say he broke faith with me? Yeah. Right? So here's brings Didn't up Didn't treat him as holy? That's right. It brings up a really interesting question that no one seems to talk about, which is he's getting punished for a, a moment of disobedience and lack of faith. No one, but at the same time, no one would ever think that Moses isn't going to be in the resurrection. Right. No one would ever... Even suggest no one, even people that believe a false system of Judaism, they yeah. they uphold Moses as being someone that's going to be honored, yeah. you know, in the future. So no one would ever even suggest that Moses isn't going to make salvation standards, that he's not going to be saved. Um, and so I just think it's it's interesting to show the dichotomy here. 
as far as what Moses, how God can speak to them and say, look, there may be punishment in this lifetime for what's going on, but he's still, if we're doing the words of the covenant, it leads to life. This is why it says in previous chapters, if you do these, you will live. Yeah. And he's not just talking about intermediate life. He's talking about the resurrection because that was the initial promise to Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole point, right? They knew they had to die first so they could be raised to eternal life because we have to get rid of this corrupted shell, you know, so we can be raised to an immortal one. Um, so we did some pairings this week from that portion. And the first pairings that we did, we actually wanted to kind of, normally we, we start off pairings with our prophets and then the how to shot the New Testament, mm-hmm. and then we go into some extra biblicals. But because of some of the content that was in that particular book and things that we wanted to highlight, uh, we're actually going to pair, start off our pairings with the extra biblicals first and then get into the, the prophets and the Brihada shot because it all flows together. It's amazing. And but, if you've been watching, you probably would know that normally we'll, we have normally we have more than just a chapter and a portion. And so we'll yeah. read a chapter and then we'll have some points of discussion that aren't necessarily involved in our pairings. But pretty much, I mean, when we read this chapter um, and we're studying it to, you know, get our get our little teaching ready, um, we kind of realized that all of our points of discussion were directly related to what we eventually wanted to pair yeah, most with of them, the yeah. portion. So, I mean... Well, I do think it's interesting. I want to point out real quick how verse 21 um, that we were talking about, Deuteronomy 32, 21, guys, where it says, For they made me jealous with what is not their God. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Yeah. And uh, I th- that is a direct correlation, um, in my opinion, to what we get from Isaiah 65 and also in Romans 11, I think it's 19 or 11. Yeah, if Romans, there's any question yeah. what he means in Deuteronomy, Paul clears it up for sure. I mean, if yeah. there's any commentary I would go to yeah. for the Torah, it would be Paul's writings. So. And that is that the foolish nation that he's talking about making Israel jealous with is this concept of the Gentiles being grafted right. in. So this is our first mention of it with Moses here in Deuteronomy 32. Isaiah 65, 1 kind of expounds upon it. And then in Romans 10, uh, I think it's 19. And then Romans 11, 11, we get it further expounded upon with Paul's commentary about how the Gentiles were promised to be grafted in, yeah. you know, because they were um, the nation that went after God, even though God didn't, didn't you know, uh, call them, basically. They were seeking God. So they were being rewarded for that. And so this is a little bit of a poetic phrasing here, the way he gives it, you know. and But he's just... As we were talking about in the first few verses here, he's detailing how they would rebel. Yeah. And this is exactly what we see in Jubilees chapter 1. It's the same prophecy. Mm-hmm. As he tells them that you guys are going to be established, but then you're going to rebel. You know, and I think we read that even last week, too, in, in the previous Torah portion. Yes. So it's just, it yeah, keeps right being before, repeated. Yeah. Right before Moses dies, he, you know, these are all these prophecies he's given about, well, you're going to get into the land, but you're going to get spewed out because <laughs> yes. you break the covenant. Yeah, it, it keeps telling them. But the good news is, like, he knows that. He's telling yeah. them right off the bat, which is why it's it's sending out a call, a clarification to all of those who may be reading the words or hearing the words of Moses as they're in that congregation and they hear, hey, you guys are going to go in the land, you're going to flourish, you guys are going to go grow fat, you're going to kick and rebel, um, do horrible things, <laughs> as it talks about here, just as you guys were in the past sacrificing the demons, as it talked about in verse 16 and 17, we see all this prophecy that they're going to turn away and do that again in the future, we got all the prophets that tell us that over and over and over with Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. These guys were going through, you know, Amos, Zephaniah. Those the bulk of the, they were, uh, they were living during the time when when Israel and Judah, the two houses, were rebelling and doing horrible horrible deeds and turning from the covenant that was being established at this time in Deuteronomy. And so, um, what I think is interesting though is that he he actually compares in verse thirty two, yeah, he says, "For your enemies themselves judges, for their vine is the vine of Sodom." And from the fields of Gomorrah. So that's very, it reminds me of Revelation 11 when it, when it talks about rebellious Israel, uh, Jerusalem, I should say. And yeah. it calls, it says spiritually, they are um, Sodom and Egypt. Yeah. You know, because of the deeds, that's why, you know, they're quote unquote of the vine of that deeds of wickedness. Just like we want to abide in the vine of Yeshua, yeah. who's in the, you know, the commandments of his father. So therefore we do the commandments just like Yeshua taught us to. Therefore we can abide in him. He is the vine, we are the branches. That's kind of where those terms go. So he's kind of a likening them to a bad vine. We don't want to be in that vine. But all right, guys. So let's look at um, let's look at Enoch 15. That's going to be our first portion from the extra biblical that we're going to pair up. And in Enoch 15, it's going to be verses six through eleven. And just so you guys know, this this is pairing with verses sixteen and seventeen. 
I know this is a long chapter, so I just want to draw your attention back to these verses. They made him jealous with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. So I just, when we were studying, I found that verse interesting. I asked my husband about it, and of course, we dove into Enoch, because that's yeah. going to explain a bit about what he means by new gods who came lately. Where did these gods come from? Right, because there's, you know... The, the days of the Exodus, they're what six, seven hundred years after um, the flood. Yeah. Okay. Not and that so long ago. It's in, not not in that long. Things. But that's our hinge point. That from yeah. on our, if a chronological timeline is in front of us, the flood is our hinge point mm -hmm. from where we get this idea of where did these demons come from. First mm -hmm. of all, what we want to dissect is we're going to go through Enoch 15 and Jubilees 10 to at least just establish what are demons because right. they're being spoken about way back in Deuteronomy 32. Right. So here in Enoch 15 verses six through 11. And, sweetie, do you want to read this, or would you like me to? You go ahead. Okay. So in verse 6, it says, But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. Uh, real quick context, guys. Um, this is, uh, Enoch is basically, uh, the fallen angels came. They're, she's not fallen, but the rebellious angels came down to earth, and they took wives, they did bad things, they produced offspring that were called the Nephilim. Um, and then Enoch, they tried to ask Enoch to go to God and petition him for forgiveness, and so this is kind of some of that conversation. So this first verse that we're looking at here in verse 6, where it says you, that pronoun is speaking, Enoch is speaking, so to speak, back to um, these, these rebellious angels. And they're basically getting an answer. And he's going to address them and their children, these offspring of the Nephilim. So verse 6 says, But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you, for, you, for as for the spiritual ones of the heaven, in heaven is their dwelling, and now the giants who are produced from the spirits, of, who are produced from the spirits and flesh, shall be called evil spirits on the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits had proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men, and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be called evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. For as the spirits of heaven in heaven shall be their dwelling, but as for the spirits of the earth which were born upon the earth, on earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger, and thirst, and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men, and against the women, because they have proceeded from them. So, this is just an introduction real quick into this idea of where do these spirits come from? What is an unclean spirit? Because remember, we, we saw Jesus dealing with them all oh, the yeah, time. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, the people were all the time. Um, bringing people to Jesus that had unclean spirits. Well, and we have these these verses in the Torah that seem so nonchalant and random and expecting people to know what he's talking about. There's no explanation in these books yeah. of, okay, well, what's a demon and where did it come from? Yes. So that's yes. where these, these extra biblicals just are yeah. so great as far as giving us context. Yeah, and I like the, the dichotomy there of how Enoch breaks down for you to explain that, you know, those who are living above the firmament in the realm called, quote-unquote, heaven, those are called spiritual beings. They yeah. have their body, their construction, um, they, they look the same, but they have different abilities, right? So that's why they can do different things. That's yeah. why when angels show up, they can do different things and according to physics because they're made spiritual bodies. And that's what he's talking about, that these giants that were from the, you know, the offspring of mating from angels who were spiritual beings and women who were physical earthy beings, mm -hmm. that these are the spirits born upon the earth. That's why it says the spirits above the heaven and heaven is their dwelling. But the spirits that were born upon the earth, those in the earth will be their dwelling. Right. They, so they can't go up there. Is that right. So they're not. And this is where we have to understand the creation model to get some of the terminology of direction to understand how um, everything underneath the firmament that was created on day two is what we consider the earth realm. Yeah. Everything above that is considered the heavenly realm where the spiritual beings live and all the other beings live down here in the earthy realm. But what he's trying to express here is that these particular spirits, normally all spirits would live above the firmament right. in, the, in the heavenly realm. But these particular ones have to live down here on the earth because they were born down here. Right. So it's kind of like they don't have a green card to go to heaven. Yeah. All right. So these guys, uh, they can't get up there. And this is why, in, you know, this could go into a whole nother video on the actual Tower of Babel. And the point and the reason they were trying to get through the firmament and get to the heavenly realm 
um, because ultimately it wasn't their place. Yeah. So it was a big no-no for a variety of reasons, but that's just one of the foundational contexts yeah. of that concept. So let's look real quick at Jubilees chapter 10. It's also going to give us further clarification of um, this whole concept of where did these guys actually come from. So in Jubilees chapter 10, we're going to be reading verses 5 through 14. That's the uh, the basic pairing there. Um and so in verse 5, it says, And thou knowest how your, the watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acted in my day. Okay, I'm going to stop real quick. I'm sorry, guys. Real quick. The setting of what we're reading here is Noah is off the boat. Okay, the flood already happened. Noah's off the boat. He's talking to, the, to God, and he's like, Hey, uh, these unclean spirits are messing with us. What's going on? You know what I mean? And that's where the father, he's expressing to the father, but then the father's going to reply through his angels to him. Um, given him an answer. So in verse five, it says, and you knowest how the watch, your watchers, the fathers of these spirits acted in my day. And as for these spirits, which are living imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation and let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my God, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy and let them not rule over the spirits of the living for you alone can exercise dominion over them and let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from here forward and forevermore. And the Lord, our God bade us to bind all. And the chief of the spirits, Mastima, came and said, Lord, Creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice, and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, he being God, said, let the tenth part of them remain before him, him being that Mastima character, okay? So let the tenth part of them remain before Mastima, and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. And none of us he commanded that we should, excuse me, and one of us he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that they would not walk in uprightness and not strive in righteousness. And we did according to all his words. All the malignant evil ones we bound in the place of condemnation, and a tenth part of them we left, that they might be subject before Satan on the earth. And we explained to Noah all the medicines of their diseases, together with their seductions, how he might be heal them with the herbs of the earth. And Noah wrote down all things in a book, as we instructed him concerning every kind of medicine. Thus the evil spirits were precluded from hurting the sons of Noah. And he gave all that he had written to Shem, his eldest son, for he loved him exceedingly above all his sons. All right. I wish we had that book. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want that book of medicine. <laughs> all right. So, all right. First thing that pops out to me in this particular little part right here is the fact where it, it contextually connects the name Mastima, the mm -hmm. chief of these spirits that got control over a tenth of these spirits. It connects him to Satan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just as we've talked about in other passages, other kingdom portions, also we do an entire in-depth show on it on Honor of Kings where we actually break down how from the book of Enoch, how this rebellious angel Azazel is the character called Satan in the modern American canon. Yeah. The one we see in Revelation, the one we see in Job chapter 1 and 2, the one that tempts Jesus in Matthew 4 and The Luke 4. one who the scapegoat is named That's after. That's right. The, in the law, the, the scapegoat who the sins are confessed over, he's released out in the wilderness. That's called the scapegoat. The word scapegoat in Hebrew is actually the word Azazel. Yeah. So this is the actual uh, uh, literal origin story of Satan, if you will, is found in the book of Enoch. And he's one of the rebellious angels. Um, and he apparently was rebelling long before the 200 watchers came down in the days of Jared, because there's other apocryphal books that actually places him in the garden of Eden as well. It's in the apocalypse of Abraham. But for what I'm, the reason why I mentioned that sweetie is because many people say, well, it's calling him Mastema. How is he, why is it now calling him Satan? The book of Enoch calls him Azazel, but then later it calls him Satan. How can it do that? Right? Because those are two different names. Oh, is it not just, is he not just called Satan? That's what revelation 20 says. The dragon, uh, the serpent of old, mm -hmm. Satan, right? Well, is he just not called Satan? Well, all right. In the Bible, there's many places where a person has more than one yeah. name. So for a great example of this is, um, I think it's in Exodus 18, where we get um, Moses' father-in-law, the father of Zipporah. Moses' father-in-law shows up, and his name is called Reuel, but it's also called Jethro. So it just depends on which one it's using at the time to speak of him. It's the same dude. Well, and Jacob it has has his name changed to Israel, but then all throughout the whole book, he, he switches back and forth between calling him Jacob or Israel. That's right. Yeah, so, depending on the context, yeah. but exactly right, because names mean things. Yeah. And there, and so, therefore, I haven't actually done a name study on what, you know, Mastima in Hebrew would be or what mm -hmm. Azazel. I mean, we know Azazel literally means scapegoat. Yeah. So that's very perfect <laughs> for that. But, um, but the point is, 
just like we see, you know, in the New Testament, John is also called Mark. Um, there's, there's, you could just, guys, you could Google real quick and it'll collate for you just a list of, you know, people with two names in the Bible and it'll bring up a ton of lists, a ton of names. So this is not an uncommon thing. This is just the way the Bible talks because it's expounding with all kinds of extra clarification at different points. And it might use, you know, I mean, I, I have a middle name. And so I guess it would be the equivalent of people calling me my first name. And then other times in my life, they call me my middle name. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't always know why they do that in the scriptures, but I know it's so abundant in the scriptures that it's easy to explain that, you know, it's not an uncommon thing. So this is how we just look for the context and then we find clarity. Yeah. Okay. So we got this guy in Jubilees called Mastima. He's linked to Satan twice in the book of Jubilees. Uh, Azazel, he's called um, Satan in the book of Enoch. And that's explained multiple times throughout that whole book. And more than anything, it's telling him right here, it's ex- expounding the same thing we just saw in the book of Enoch about how these unclean spirits that came forth from the watchers was going to become the unclean spirits that we deal with after the flood. And Noah was already having to deal with them. Yeah. Uh, Poor guy, because there was like eight of them. And there's, you know, who knows how many many unclean spirits. And they serve the purpose of, because Mastima says here, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. Um, Yeah, because it says, you know, for the point of them was to, as Enoch talked to us about, you know, their their purpose was to afflict, oppress, destroy, right. attack, do battle, work destruction on the earth, and just overall cause trouble. Yeah. <laughs> that's isn't that's what they do, right? That's the point. That's why we see everywhere Jesus goes, um, he's always having to address these unclean spirits who are affecting people. You yeah. Know, in various well, different ways. If you think about that term sons of disobedience, mm-hmm. I mean it just really it it really makes sense when you understand that while there is a dark angel for lack of a better term, you know, who's in charge of them and that the purpose they serve is to do his bidding. Um, and what does he do? He disobeys That's right. or he gets everyone to disobey. Yes. I don't know how that works. But. That's when the book of Enoch describes in great detail how Azazel taught mankind different types of corruption, yeah. different types of bad behavior. Um, and he taught them how to do the behavior on their own to perpetuate it in you know greater ways. Yeah. So it was, Anyway, that's kind of the, the MO of the enemy. He, he wants us to do the bad behavior ourselves. He doesn't force us to do it. He teaches us how to do it um, so that we can be responsible. <laughs> the point Not is, him. is demons are mentioned here in the Old Testament. Right here in the Torah, we have, you know, quite a few actual references to the, the children of Israel sacrificing to these demons. And so occasionally you might come across some people who are preaching that there just aren't demons at all. They don't even exist. They're not mentioned in the Torah. And therefore, if they weren't ever in the Torah, then Mm -hmm. anything mentioned later in the New Testament is just a mistranslation or something weird like that. But it's very clearly, it's very clearly right there in the law. And Father was dealing with the fact that they were sacrificing to these demons. Yeah, that's what Leviticus 17, I believe. It even talks about how... Um, people were out in the field sacrificing to goat demons. Goat demons. And, and what like, do we have today? The Baphomet? I mean, yeah, it's... Yeah. And he just tells them in the law, don't do that anymore. Yeah. Come to the tabernacle meeting, sacrifice to me, <laughs> <laughs> not to goat demons. So yes, demons have been very prevalent yeah. in the law and all the prophets, uh, all throughout the historical books of Israel. Jesus is dealing with them in his time. Um, they do have an end yeah. ascribed to them. And that's what we're going to explain at the rest of this show. So stay tuned to the end, guys, because we're going to go through actually the moment in the future where we don't have to deal with them anymore and it's it's a glorious concept but we just want to kind of establish you know where they came from as we just did we also want to look at real quick in our parents from the Brit Hadashah this is also called the New Testament and we're just looking real quick on how um, Jesus had to interact with them everywhere he went and it was kind of a big deal for him because they popped up a lot this was a big part of his ministry yes and the people were amazed you know like the ones that were creating people uh to be mute Mm -hmm. the demons that caused people to be mute jesus would you know kick them out and they were amazed that he had this kind of authority you know and so he was like yeah well these some come out by prayer some come out by prayer and fasting you know which is a, a more dedicated version of prayer you know so it's like uh, he was just telling them that we do have, we can have authority over these things. We do, we just have to walk in the commandments. Yeah. Uh, that's a big part of it, in my opinion. And that's, in my opinion, why we don't, why we see any kind of modern day deliverance ministries turns into like a circus yeah. of this long event of them back and forth with these uh, unclean entities. And, you know, it doesn't have to, it could be as simple as what Jesus showed us just to say, go to yeah. get out of them. Um, but you have to be walking in the authority of the father, meaning you're doing his deeds. You're doing the commandments. So that's kind of the hinge point there, but let's look real quick in Luke chapter eight. And this is going to be in verses 26 through 33. If you're following along, 
uh, verse 26. It says, And then he sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, who had not put on any clothing for a long time, and was not living in a house, but in tombs. Seeing Jesus, the man cried out and fell before him, and said in a loud voice, What business do you have with me? Excuse me, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Isn't it interesting that this this demon inside this man calls him Jesus, son of the most high God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. why didn't he just call him the father if there was, if it was, <laughs> anyway, whatever. That's so, yeah, a different video, babe. It's a different video. <laughs> So yes, even the demons... I think we have a few videos on that already, actually. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, Even the demons knew the difference that the Father is the Father and Jesus was the Son. Enoch goes into great detail about how the Son was with the Father before creation. And that they're two separate entities, all right? And that uh, (laughs) Yahweh in the Old Testament is the Father. And then Jesus, who showed up incarnate through Mary, is the Son. And we did actually just read that in Deuteronomy 31 we where did. it says i am the lord am i not your father so. that's right yes we did yeah he calls him himself yahweh is speaking he calls yeah. himself his father so yeah there's a distinction and even the enemy knows the distinction yeah. so i think it's important that we do too as his disciples so um so in verse 29 he says for jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for it seized him many times and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert and Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountains, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. All right, so there's some interesting things here that I wanted to point out, is that not, not just the, um, the aside moment we just had about how the demons knew the difference between the father and son, but... Uh, the demon himself was saying um, uh, they implored him not to send them into the abyss. So yeah. they're asking Jesus, don't send us to the abyss. Um, because what did we just read in Jubilees? That of all the demons that were the disembodied spirits of these giants, of these Nephilim from pre-flood, that nine-tenths of them, so 90% of them, went into the abyss, the place of condemnation. Yeah. And then one-tenth of them was left on the earth. And so they're, th- they're saying, please don't send us to the abyss. Right? Yeah. And he didn't. Why didn't he? Because it wasn't the appointed time. And Jubilee, God the Father had already declared yeah. back in Jubilees and back in Enoch after the flood that a tenth of them would be left on the earth. This was, a, this was his declaration. So Yeshua is abiding by information mm-hmm. he would have only gotten from those two extra biblical books. Imagine that. <laughs> wow. So I think that's interesting. Now let's look over at the parallel, the, the um a uh, parallel account in Matthew chapter 8. Well, and the demons themselves wouldn't know there was a point at, an appointed right, exactly time from right. any of the yeah, how proved could, scriptures. Well, they don't really <laughs> talk about now. the appointed time in that one. I think we're going to look at that in Matthew 8, actually. Yeah, I figured. So, I, I thought Matthew, we had that. Matthew uh, 8, if, guys, if you're following along in your Bibles at home, it's verse 28 through 32. And it says, And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, Two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were extremely violent so that that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to to torment us before the appointed time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons begged to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down in the steep bank in the sea and perished in the waters. So... Paralleled, very similar story, you know, same place geographically, um, same people involved. Uh, this one actually mentions two dudes came out, but as Luke talks about, he actually just talks to one of them, yeah. right? But there were actually two dudes involved in this in this idea. And how fitting is it that they're hanging out in the tombs? <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, they're just chilling at the, in the graveyard. But they come out, and what do they say in Luke? Because they say, you know, please don't send us to the abyss, mm-hmm. right? So it's almost, you know, I'm not saying they are testing him. I'm not saying they're being that crafty in that moment. But we now that we have this context of Enoch and Jubilees to, to understand why one-tenth of those unclean spirits were left on the earth, yeah. they weren't supposed to go to the abyss anyway. But maybe he thought, you know, since Yeshua was walking in the authority of God, of the Father, maybe he thought he was going to change that or something. Well, and if it's, I no. mean, really, if you think about it, if they're unclean spirits, I would think they don't have the gift of faith. I think the gift of faith is what helps you, you know, know, oh, well, he's here now, but the word said there's this appointed time later on. Right. So, but if they don't yeah. have that gift of faith, well, then, yeah, the, I'd the, probably be scared if I were them. 
Yeah, they're scared all the way around because they're dealing with true authority. Yeah. But what I'm saying is there's two different things mentioned in these two different passages. Luke 8 talks about the abyss. Matthew 8 talks about being tormented before the appointed yeah. time. There's a difference. In Enoch, we get the play, and we're going to read about it later, when they're actually tormented. And they're brought out of the abyss. Okay, so there's a difference here. The, the Luke 8 moment is one of them is saying, please don't send us to the abyss. The Matthew 8 moment, one of them or the same guy with further explanation is saying, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? So they, they know that there's an abyss that they might be sent to because others were sent there. And they know that there is a time in the future mm -hmm. that has been appointed for their destruction. So this is what we're going to actually um, pick up and keep reading. Actually, before we do, though, let's actually read about those moments. And then we're going to jump back to the extra biblicals. And we're going to read about where how those moments were prophesied, which is will make sense of what we've read from Revelation 20 so for so many years. But so many people may have not ever read these extra biblical books um, that have been taken out of the Bible over time. So they're confused when right. they read Revelation 20. And they read about the, the end result of these events, and they don't know what they're reading or looking at. So let's go to Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. That's going to be our next little uh, next little pairing. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. Do you want to read that one, or should I? Yeah, I'll read it. And okay. then we're doing 7 and 10 after that, right? And after that, we're going to skip to 7 and 10. Okay. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And then down to verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's right. So, so we have this concept of Satan being locked and bound at the beginning of the thousand years, and at the end of it, he's pulled out, and it just says that he goes out and deceives the nations. And then, so let's keep that in mind as we're going to read these additional parents from extra biblical books. Okay, so we're going to look first into Enoch chapter 54, and this one is going to help us with um, just kind of understanding end of days and end of demons <laughs> if i could put it like that so this is definitely a, a joyous thing we're about to read so enoch chapter 54 verses 1 through 6 and this says and i looked and turned to another part of the earth and, the, and saw there a deep valley with burning fire and they brought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them into this deep valley and there mine eyes saw how they made these their instruments iron chains of immeasurable weight it sounds kind of like the big chain we saw michael just wrap up satan in, right and I asked the angel of peace who went with me, saying, For whom are these chains being prepared? And he said unto me, These are being prepared for the hosts of Azazel. Hosts being the armies of mm -hmm. those who, you know. All right. So that, uh, keep going. So that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation. And they shall cover their jaws with rough stones, as the Lord of Spirits commanded. And Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them on that day into the burning furnace so that the Lord of Spirits may take vengeance on them for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. All right. So back in Enoch chapter eight, we get prophesied that Azazel will be judged and thrown into the earth and covered with rough stones, just like we see in Revelation 20 verse one through three. But as, as you know, we're always talking about context you know, the scriptures, the prophets, you know, they're getting all this info, but it's not always put in chronological order. Right. Same thing with the book of Enoch, right? So back in chapter 8, we get Azazel's punishment. But here in chapter 54, we get the punishment for all those who subjected themselves mm -hmm. to Satan and the, the hosts of him, if, if I could say it like that. And so this is why they're saying they're, they're, some are being put into the abyss of complete condemnation. And they shall take hold of on that great day and cast them into the burning furnace. All right, so there's a difference here as far as... Um, at one point, these are being taken and they're placed into the abyss of complete condemnation. And then these four angels shall take hold of them on the great day, which is what we read in Revelation 7 through 10, which is um, 
when they're after the thousand years, and that's why 11 through 15, Revelation 11 through 15, is the great white throne judgment. So leading up to the great white throne judgment is the end of the thousand years. Satan is released, and he comes about to deceive the nations, and then you have everything else brought forward for him for the great white throne judgment because there's after the second resurrection. There's a little more theirs, but we're not going into that type of resurrection right now. But the point is, this happens in stages. That's what I'm trying to explain to folks. So verse 5 in Enoch 54, 5 is stage 1. This is at the day of the Lord. This is when Yeshua returns. And those, he talks about the hosts of Azazel, all right? So this would be the demons, the kings and the mighty, anyone that subjected themselves yeah. to Satan to lead astray those who are on the earth. They're thrown into the abyss of complete condemnation. They're thrown into the abyss um, to await this great white throne judgment where they're there take hold of them who've been wrapped in these chains and then cast them into the burning furnace, which is the lake of fire moment we see in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. Okay, so they're not destroyed in the lake of fire at the beginning of the millennial right. reign. They're destroyed. The, only the beast the and the end. false prophet seem to be the ones detailed in Revelation 19 okay. to be thrown into the lake of fire first. They get the first privileges. <laughs> That's not a good thing. Yeah. So they get they get to be thrown in there first at the beginning of the millennial reign, okay? But then at the end, this is as far as I can uh, understand it from all these passages put together, okay? they giving you the timeline. Yeshua returns, the beast and the false prophet are the first ones thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is thrown into a hole in the ground for a thousand years. He gets out at the end of the thousand years, it's causing a little bit more trouble. But then at the end of the thousand years, everything else in Sheol, all the unclean spirits, all the unrighteous men that had lived and died throughout that whole time period, that didn't that will not receive resurrection mm -hmm. unto life. And Satan himself, all of them are taken and thrown into the lake of fire, extinguished from existence forever. Okay? So that's why it's called complete condemnation. They're done. Now, when so he's released at the end for a short time, it's just him. Is it ju it's just, just him. him. It's just not him. him and all his hosts. That's right. Just him. He's the only one released. It's interesting. So they're not all let out. It's just him, apparently. And th which is, you know, um, has to do with, you know, kind of the context of his pronounced judgment in, you know, yeah. chapter eight. And that's why, you know, it, it's God is lawful. He's a, he's a God who is just and lawful. All right. So the things that the beast and the false prophet did deserved the immediate destruction of their soul. Okay, because remember, guys, the context of Matthew ten twenty eight when Jesus explains that we should not fear those who can kill just the body, but God who can kill both the body and the soul mm -hmm. in Gehenna. And and that and people get confused by that little verse there because yeah. it says the word hell, and that's just a generic English yeah. translation. If you look up the Greek, it's the word Gehenna, which is the Greek word for the lake of fire. Yeah. So Jesus is saying in that passage that God can destroy both the body and the soul in the lake of fire. But there is appointed times for when these things take place. That's why the demons in Luke chapter 8 are mentioning, or excuse me, Matthew 8, are mentioning an appointed time. Yeah. And, and so if we try to mix this story together and don't understand the appointed times, or if we don't have the back history from Jubilees and Enoch or whatever, that's how we have all these strange discussions and debates and different branches from different divisions of uh, Christian belief that claim way different things because they don't, it's hard for them to piece together the timeline. So I want to extend to them a measure of leniency, you know what I mean? Because it took me a long time Yeah. after reading a lot of the extra biblicals and really studying this in depth to realize, oh wait, there's qualifying markers of times. These are called appointed times for these things that God listed out. And so there's even appointed times for the death of Satan, mm -hmm. which is thrown in the lake of fire. It's at the end of the millennial reign. And there's appointed times, according to Enoch, for the death of the hosts, the armies of Satan, which are these ones that were subjected to him in Enoch and uh, Enoch 15 and Jubilees 10. Yeah. Okay. So that's important for, in my opinion, for people to really grasp this idea. And that's, you know, um, and to me, it's only fitting because what we're experiencing in the uh, millennial reign, which is so beautiful, is a time without Satan. Yeah. Without the demonic influences. So... That's why I jokingly said, you know, the end of days is the end of demons. So yeah. the end of days is a very, you know, colloquial term we use in our culture. It's it's just talking about the day of the Lord, the day that yeah. he returns. It doesn't mean that all life is going to cease to exist. No, actually, life gets better when he returns. Well, it's it, the end of days. That, like eternity itself starts at some point right, where we're right, not yeah. counting anymore. Well, I mean, we do count for the first thousand well, years, but after that, yeah. I mean, so it's like, that's why this term is so taken out of context. And I just want to say that real quick. 
When we're talking about end of days, it just means the day of the Lord. When Yeshua returns through the sky with his army angels to take out the wicked, first resurrection happens, New Jerusalem's coming behind him, and that is the promised land to be set down. And while that New Jerusalem is set down upon the earth, and all the resurrected saints are living inside of it, all the survivors are living on the outside of it on the day of the Lord, and they're not going to be faced with what we're faced with today, yeah. which is all this unclean spirits constantly doing what? Attacking, destroying, causing trouble, oppressing, doing all these things that we deal with, causing sickness and disease. And whatever natural sicknesses and disease that may come about, we've got the leaves of the yeah, trees of life growing in the city. Yeah, they're going to have the living witness of the New Jerusalem itself and all of us walking around like light bulbs right. teaching them the Torah. So Life you know. will just increase exponentially beyond yeah. anything we've ever thought. There's no more war. The land itself is being healed. That's why in the Song of Moses we just read, I think it was verse... Let me see if we can find it real quick. Um, because uh, he actually talks about this. It's either verse 46 or 47. But uh, he says... Um, I see verse 43. He says, He will render vengeance on his enemies and will atone for his land and his people. Yep. So we're the people are atoned for. We're resurrected into righteousness and eternal righteousness, new new bodies, spiritual bodies that are incorruptible. We're living inside the new Jerusalem. And the land is purified. The people inside are purified. And then the land outside the new Jerusalem is destroyed and nasty and gross, but it's being healed yeah. from the river of life that flows from the throne of God from within the city, outside of the city to all the other waterways of the earth to yeah. heal the earth. And then, of course, we're going to be teaching the people how to walk in righteousness, which will also help heal the earth faster as well. So it's yeah, a beautiful time. going to be no atheists in the, That's right. in the That's new right. earth. <laughs> That's right. No and, atheists in foxholes and none of them in the new earth either. <laughs> in the millennial reign, there's no atheists. So in verse 5 of Jubilees, chapter 50, we get a glimpse of this as well. And it says in verse 5, And the Jubilees shall pass by until Israel is cleansed from all guilt of fornication and uncleanliness and pollution and sin and error. And they dwell with confidence in the land. And there shall be no more a Satan or any evil one. And the land shall be clean from that time forevermore. It's awesome. It is awesome. Um, and then we're going to see, uh, that's just a beautiful promise at the end of the book of Jubilees. But let's look real quick at one of the prophets. This is our prophet's period yes. from the book of Micah. And and I feel bad for Micah because he's so overlooked, you know. But he's a, such a great prophet. Most of the, quote, minor prophets are so overlooked, but it's, they've got awesome stuff in them. They really do, man. Um, because they're saying the same things as the, quote, unquote, big boys. The major yeah. prophets like yeah. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. They're saying the same stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, But until you understand the context of the day of the Lord, which is what on our context tree here on this channel's context tree is yeah. called the return of the king. Um, until you understand, you know, the context of Sheol, the mm -hmm. eternal covenant or the covenants, the eternal Torah, return of the king, the new Jerusalem. Many of the things that I put on the context tree, sometimes when you read the minor prophets, heck, even the major prophets. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know what you're reading because yeah. you don't have the fundamental context that's given to us about these major themes continually spoken of all throughout scripture from start to finish. So. Sweetie, do you want me to read this one, or do you want to read this one? Uh, you've read most of them. Okay, I'll so go you can ahead read this one. This is going to be in Micah 4, verses 1 through 7, for those of you who are following along. And we paired this off of Deuteronomy 32, verses 41 and 43. And the reason we're reading it last is because what we surmise from reading chapter 30, is it 31 we read this week? 30, 32. 32, sorry. I don't know why I keep getting this mixed up. What we surmise basically when we read it is the basic theme of the whole chapter is Day of the Lord some pretty serious stuff involving judgment. And so since this is kingdom in context, and you guys know we love to bring it, you know, back to the main focus of keeping your eyes on the kingdom, we wanted to kind of end on this positive note of reminding everybody what we're waiting for. Yes, we have, you know, some severe judgments coming for some wicked souls, um, but this is what we get to look forward to. So this sure. is what, especially on the, you know, the Feast of Sukkot, yes. the Feast of Tabernacles, we want to look forward to this kind of thing. So. Sorry, I won't get back to reading. All, <laughs> All right, so Micah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 7. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And 
and we and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation will not lift sword lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the mouth of the lord of hosts has spoken though all the peoples walk each in the name of his god as for us we will walk in the name of the lord our god forever and ever in that day declares the lord i will assemble assemble the lame and gather the outcasts even those whom i have afflicted and i will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation and the lord will reign over them in mount zion from now on and forever it's beautiful it's beautiful guys and and passages like that are repeated throughout all the prophets yeah. it's beautiful so we have just as a short summary from what we've talked about the song of moses is in general 32 what he's saying what he's quote unquote singing yeah. it says he taught the song to them after this so it's i don't know if he actually come up with a tune or what but um i mean just think about moses singing usually we think about this staunch old guy yeah. that's like really gruff and you know he's like oh there you guys rebel but uh, i mean the dude the guys father promises us that if we do his commandments yeah. we will have joy so it's hard for me now once i really grasp that in my mind to look back at these patriarchs these guys in the past and to see how they were doing so faithfully the father's commands to think that they were had bad attitudes or gruffy gruffy demeanors yeah. you know what i mean no i think they were full of joy I think they had great dispositions and were like pleasant people, you yeah. know? So I just, I think that, um, I don't know, it was, it was very interesting to me. And I'm thinking, is he seeing this? Is he not? But as a short recap, within this whole context, 30, Jeremy 32, he's talking about the establishment of them, how they came into their own as a people, how they rebelled, and then when what types were by and they were being sacrificed into demons, mm-hmm. right? They picked that up again later. But then he promises at the end of it, and that's what we lead in, you know, starting in verses uh, 41 through, through I think 45. But he starts talking about how the day of the Lord, right? How he's going to come back, he's going to take care of these things, and he's going to wipe out his adversaries. That was in verse 43 yeah. to atone for the land and his people. Now the only reason he can say that, and the people that he's talking to have any kind of context of that, of what he's talking about, is if they had any new awareness from the Book of Enoch, yeah. where all that kind of stuff is prophesied in abundance multiple chapters i think it's like chapter 48 chapter 54 uh chapter 62 chapter 63 chapters 105 like an abundance of places in the book of enoch is it talks about how the son of man the son of god is the messiah who reigns that the father sets on the throne of the father's authority to reign his stead and do exact judgment on the adversaries against truth against justice against righteousness against the father's ways and how those are routed out from the land forever on the day of the lord Except for this one little glimpse of a moment at the end of the lo- at the end of Revelation twenty, or at the end of the millennial reign, I should say, um, and this seems to be why it's even marked as a millennial reign because it's a thousand years and Satan's let back out. Oh right, 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 yeah. And so, and that's why we have this concept of how you know what it was it say in First Corinthians fifteen, you know that yeah. once all the enemies of God are, are dealt with. Yeshua can hand back over his authority to the Father. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But the authority that was given to him, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth. And Satan is seems to be the last character yeah. that is not dealt with because and that's what I was saying earlier about how God is just. He follows his laws. So this is where if we understand that whole context, it seems to be that Satan knows the law so well, not only can he fool us into not doing it, or to make us do something contrary to law and think that we're doing the law, right? That's why we have to know the law for ourselves. But he knows the law so well that he can skirt punishments and judgments. You know what I mean? Because as we read in the book of um, um, Jubilees a few weeks, I think it was our second kingdom portions. I think we read from um, how during the days of Joseph's reign, there was no Satan in the land of Egypt. So it seems to be that he was kind of kept away or put away for a certain time. Yeah. It's like punished or or something. And there was short-term punishment. Locked up. Yeah, no, it says time. he was he was locked away for a short little time. Um, and then we also have in the book of, um, uh, well, no, that's a different story. That's a different story. I won't, I won't blend, blend that too much. But the idea is that the Father works through his laws, and that's important to know. His angels know his law. They're keeping his law mm-hmm. in heaven, as Jubilees and Enoch tells us and all these other places. Um, as, as the entire Torah tells us, yeah. since they gave him the words of the covenant, from the tabernacle on the law being ministered in heaven, they said, okay, you guys do a copy and shadow down here on the earth. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole Bible tells us that 
they're already keeping the law in heaven. And this is the point. And when the Messiah, who reigns in heaven and earth, mm -hmm. when he brings the kingdom down to the earth, and we're all keeping the law on the earth as well, that's how we have a place of peace yeah. and righteousness with no war and no strife. Yeah. But if an angel rebels, that means he knows the law really, really well. And that's where Satan has become a great adversary to fool mankind, which is why Revelation 12 says he is the one that fools yeah. the entire world. But at the same time, he does attack those who try to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of the faith in Jesus. And that's where, you know, we have to know his word. And this is why we're doing these things so people can get the foundation. They get the fundamentals of this idea. Because within the gospel of the kingdom of God that Jesus preached everywhere he went is all these fundamental concepts of understanding how what we're doing, this behavior that we're learning from his instructions to us in the Torah, is the behavior we'll be doing in the kingdom to come. And that's what protects us from deception and protects us from failure, so to speak, of being overcome by the enemy. And so what am I saying? Is Sean saying that we will never have find oppression? That we'll never, because that was the point of the enemies of, that subjected themselves to Satan. Is Sean saying that Satan will never be able to suppress or uh, persecute mm -hmm. those who are of the faith? No, of course not. We even see that in Revelation 13, 8, where the, the Satan, the dragon, gives his authority to the Antichrist, and the Antichrist overcomes the saints and persecutes them killing many of them so we understand that this is a, a real reality in the life that we're in that they do not want us to persist or live or share the truth but what i'm saying is in the meantime the whole point of doing the behavior of the kingdom is so that we can have fulfillment in our life we can have joy we can walk in blessing and empower that there and that and the only reason we see that in revelation 13 8 with the antichrist is because it was appointed to him at that time during a short 42 month time period to test those who are of the faith it's called a time of trial you know and that's why it's called tribulation it's a time of trial Well, that's also pretty much what was stated in jubilees about that mess mm -hmm. character and what his perp i mean clearly he, ha he serves yeah. a purpose yeah it may not be a pleasant one but yeah. i mean the reality is is we don't have a choice between choosing god's ways or some sort of alternate way to live um do we really have any kind of free will do we you know what are you saying i'm saying the purpose that some people like atheists would say what kind of loving god would create an enemy of humanity gotcha. to get them to break his laws well if we don't have the choice to choose between his ways or some other ways that aren't his do we really have any kind of free will? Do we really have any kind of free choice in right. in that? So, and how much does it really mean if you know if we have no other choice but to serve Him? Is that really love? I mean, yeah, like I, like I've always said that the opportunity for us to obey, yeah, gives Him the opportunity to reward our obedience. Yeah, if we were just mindless program machines that always did what was God considered righteous. Yeah. There would be no reward for obedience. There would be no relationship at all. I'm it not would... sure there would be actual love. <laughs> no, you know, no. you're not expressing any form of love by. Right. Love is by chosen doing that. from us yeah. choosing to do right or wrong, yeah. and that's yeah. So that's absolutely, it's a part of the inherent creation model is we have to have the ability to choose what's right. Yeah. So that we can receive blessing. That's part of the law itself. So it's inherently included, and therefore it means there has to be an antagonist, um, and these people these entities have chosen to become that role, so yeah. to speak, you know, whether they, I don't, I don't want to get into, into their motivations, but yeah. they've, you know, as the father stated to us, those entities have become that role that try to tempt us and oppress and attack and, you know, work cause trouble on the earth. So the way we avoid that and the way we, to we, um, until the time of the antichrist shows up, the way that we have power in our lives is to do God's instructions for living called his laws this is why Jesus commanded us to do them. This is what not only will bring us joy, but will bring us a uh, blessing. As, yeah. as we read two Torah portions ago, Jeremiah 27, 28. So that's why we want to encourage you guys um, to study up and, and practice them just as we are actively trying to practice them in our life. And it's God's great joy and blessing. And we have a good time loving God, you know, loving each other. So um, we thank you for joining us. This has been a fun one. It's kind of a short, short chapter, just thir two Jeremiah 32. But at the same time, there's so much good stuff in there uh, that I think um, hopefully this will be a blessing to you, this video. Anything you'd like to say before we leave?
As always, just if you made it all the way, thanks for watching the whole thing. We appreciate it. Give us a like. Give us a share. Um, if you know anyone who's looking for, you know, a, a more kingdom-focused type of Bible study, you know, send them our way. Um, if you're not friends with us on Facebook, I'm Lindsay with an E-Y, and he's S-E-A-N, Sean. Uh, and obviously, we're Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N, <laughs> the Griffins. Um, yeah, you know, and you could come fellowship with us on Facebook. Um, drop any questions or comments down below. Hello. And just remember that context creates comprehension. That's our little catchphrase here. Um, and all that means is that the more you dig into the context of something, the better you're going to be able to comprehend it. So as you can see, if you've been following these shows, um, you've probably realized um, just how important it is to have the full context of something to really be able to teach it to others and to be able to answer other people's objections to it. So if you really want to be able to preach the gospel to all creatures, you just got to keep it in context. So. That's right. Yes. Very nicely spoken. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Kingdom Portions, and have a good week. Have a good one, guys. Shabbat shalom.